Hello, and welcome to the Round Lake Area Library's virtual program series, Feed Your Mind and Body. This program is going to talk about getting started on a low carb diet. First, we need to say that we are not advocating this diet. This diet is not for everyone. Many medications and health conditions make it dangerous, so you should only follow a low carb lifestyle if you've been advised to do so by a medical doctor or a nutritionist. And you need to know what your carb goal should be. So for some, it's going to be 25 grams a day, but for others, it's 125 grams a day. So please get some medical guidance before starting this. We're also not going to address everything about this diet. You'll have to do your research based upon whatever carb limits you have. People looking to hit and maintain ketosis will have very different options than someone who needs to just keep their carbs under 100 grams a day. We're just going to tell you some things about the beginning of this journey so that it will hopefully help. All foods are made up of macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients are chemicals our body needs in large doses like fats, carbs, proteins, potassium, sodium, calcium, things like that. Micronutrients are vitamins and minerals, things we require in smaller amounts like iron, vitamin D, and so on. Your focus when going low carb is three macronutrients, fats, carbs, and proteins. And the goal is to eliminate as many bad fats as possible, add as many good fats as possible, limit carbs, and usually limit protein as well. Those numbers you'll determine with your doctor. Okay, so how do you lower your carbs? First of all, you're gonna have to learn how to read a nutrition label. What's important is to know how to calculate your net carbs. There are two types of carbs, digestible carbs and indigestible carbs. Fiber is an indigestible carb. So when you look at the nutrition label and you see the total carbs are 10 grams and the fiber is three of those grams, your net carbs are only seven grams because although fiber is a carb, it goes right through you. So you have to get used to looking at both the total carbs and the fiber and then calculate your net carbs. Then as with almost every diet, you're going to be giving up a lot of foods you love. Bread, pasta, potatoes, sugar, tropical fruits, which aren't just mangoes and papayas, but also bananas rice, beans, and most alcohol. But there are things that you can have that might surprise you and substitutions are very important so that you can make the losses less difficult. For instance, you can have dark chocolate. It has to be really dark, 70% or more, but chocolate is low carb without any sweetener in it. The world has also gone completely insane, finding new and different ways to try to turn cauliflower into things that it is not. I'm okay with riced cauliflower, cauliflower mac and cheese, mashed cauliflower, I'll even eat cauliflower pizza crust, but I draw the line at slabs of cauliflower being fried and called a steak substitute. That's subjective and you can decide how many things you'll allow cauliflower to pretend to be. You can also use various squashes in place of pasta, like zoodles and spaghetti squash. They also sell shirataki noodles, and I should warn you if you've never dealt with these. They are noodles made of the root of a yam, and if you don't research this in great depth and find the right brand, you could end up with these slimy tendrils that reek of algae or fish so strong it'll take your breath away and you have to rinse and soak them for a long time to get rid of that odor and taste and even then you can only use them in dishes with very strong flavors so that it'll overpower that fishiness. Much happier substitutions are the variety of wraps available, veggie fries, low carb pancake or waffle mix, a variety of sugar substitutes, nut flours, and dairy to the rescue. These are items that are becoming more and more accessible. More nut flours in the grocery store, more sweeteners, more flax cereals, and low-carb granolas. It is much easier today than it was 10 years ago, even 5 years ago. 
If you were able to register for the program and received a kit, you got low carb wraps, packets of stevia sweetener to try, a bag of pork rinds, and a small bag of walnuts. The pork rinds and the walnuts are for snacking or for breading things, which I will show you later. You also received recipes and a spreadsheet showing you common substitutions for things you can no longer have, which I will link to in the comments for those who do not have the handout. This program will show you how to make fathead dough into pizza, spaghetti squash, and breaded chicken with either walnuts or pork rinds. Two of these dishes require marinara, so let's talk about that. If you buy jarred sauce like Prego, a one half cup serving has 13 grams of total carbs minus three grams of fiber for a net of 10 grams. Regu has 11 total grams minus 3 grams of fiber for a total of 8 grams, making Regu the better brand. The brand with the lowest carbs is Rao's with 3 grams of net carbs, although I don't know how they do that. However, it's not cheap. At Woodman's, it costs $6.59 for one jar, $8.79 at Meyer, and $9.19 at Jewel. You can find no sugar versions of popular cheaper brands, so look for those. However, not only am I cheap, I like to control what my marinara will taste like, so I'll just throw a batch together. So now it's down to canned or fresh tomatoes. Canned tomatoes have additives, so they have about 6.7 grams of carbs per half cup, while starting with actual tomatoes will be about 3 grams per tomato, which is slightly more than half a cup. Add about 3 grams for a third of an onion, a gram for garlic, basil, and oregano. And canned tomatoes will make your sauce about 10.7 grams versus fresh or frozen tomatoes as your base, running about 7 grams. It may seem like splitting hairs if you're on a 100 gram a day diet, but if you're shooting for ketosis and only get 50 grams a day, it's a little more important. And Atkins induction phase limits you to 20 grams a day. So it's crucial, every single gram. My sauce is going to start with canned Prego traditional as my base. And then I'm gonna add canned tomatoes to that with sauteed onions and garlic and lots of basil, red pepper flakes, and oregano, which would make my sauce about 15 grams per half cup. I do this because, because my carb intake isn't that stringent and I like a lot of flavor. My sauce is going to make two recipes, and this is what their carb counts will each look like. For fathead dough pizza, half the recipe of dough will be about 10 grams. Mozzarella and Parmesan cheeses have negligible amounts of grams, less than a gram, so my 15 gram sauce plus 10 grams for the crust is 25 grams for the meal. For spaghetti squash, one cup of cubed squash is 5.5 grams, but we're going to cook and shred it, which will make it harder to measure a dense cup, but I'll estimate about a cup of spaghetti squash for my serving with 15 grams of sauce, so my total will be 20.5 grams. As a comparison, the equivalent homemade pizza with a regular flour crust is over 63 grams alone plus sauce, making it 70 to 100 grams of carbs, whereas our low-carb crust pizza is about 25. And one cup of cooked spaghetti is roughly 40 grams alone, plus sauce, taking it well over 50 grams for a one cup pasta dish. For low-carb spaghetti squash, it's around 20. And keep in mind, if you have cheese to put on top, meatballs, meat to add to the sauce, or even a chicken breast, it's going to increase how much you're eating by a lot, but the carb count will barely move. We already know fathead dough has four normal ingredients, and that's what this recipe calls for, no additions, so it should be very easy. Three quarters of a cup of almond flour, one and a half cups of mozzarella cheese, two tablespoons of cream cheese, and one egg. The first thing we do is melt the cheeses in a microwave or a double boiler. 
It doesn't take long. My microwave did the job in 30 seconds. We don't want it too hot to handle, just soft enough to mix with the almond flour and egg. When I have the cheese to the desired texture, I'll combine them. This is going to be an incredibly sticky dough. Some people prefer to put it all in the food processor and more power to you folks, but I'm not about to make more dirty dishes than necessary. When I have things basically together, I'll start mixing by hand. Once combined, you can put it in the fridge for it to cool off for a little bit. It will be a lot easier to roll out when it's cooled. I am a native Chicago girl and pizza is a big part of my life. So when I make homemade pizza, I make it on a pizza stone. I have two of them. They are very well loved. Okay, so this is my technique for rolling out this dough, but you can use whatever works for you. I set a piece of wax paper on my baking sheet slash pizza stone. I plop the world's stickiest dough onto the wax paper. This helps me gauge the size and shape in relation to the pan I'm using. For me, a rolling pin is just too difficult for this dough and I prefer to flatten it by hand, working my way from the center out, trying to keep it relatively thin without leaving it too thin or losing bits of it when I pull my hand away. I don't care about irregular edges, but I don't want little peninsulas of dough sticking out, so I bring it to a rough circle. Here's the fun part. I flip the whole thing over by the wax paper, center the dough in the middle-ish of the pan, and then slowly pull the wax paper off the dough. It should release easily and cleanly, leaving a lovely flat surface. I don't know who taught me this, but it is incredibly handy. From here, I'm going to put the pizza stone into the oven at 350 degrees and let it bake. How long will depend on how thick it is, so just start monitoring it about 6 minutes in or be a complete daredevil like me and judge it by the aroma. Here we have a lovely cooked fat head pizza dough. They say you can make and store uncooked dough wrapped in plastic in the fridge or freeze it, and you can wrap and store the uncooked crust as well. But a crust like this, begging for toppings, isn't going to last long in my house. It will fulfill its destiny quickly. To the crust I add the homemade sauce I put together. I like a thin crust and a chunky sauce. I also add even more oregano to this stage because pizza needs heaps of oregano to me. Then I add mozzarella. And then parmesan. At this point, if you have pepperoni, sausage, bacon, or other meat toppings, great, add what you like. Pepperoni is popular for low carbers because it has no carbs and is so good with mozzarella. If you have veggies, check those closely. Things like onions, peppers, mushrooms, and olives have carbs, and they'll add up quickly. I'm going with a simple cheese pizza, but I do like pepper on mine. Again, I require a lot of flavor. Back into the oven it will go to bake for a bit. Depending on your toppings, you'll cook to your preferred level of cheese doneness. Using canned tomatoes in my sauce and large quantities of it on my pizza, plus the blizzard of cheese means I'll be cleaning up spillage, but I like it that way. I'll let this cool a little after it finishes cooking because I don't like having to wrestle and dam a bunch of sauce and cheese. It needs to gel up a bit. Plus, tomato sauce tends to get super hot and it needs to chill so no tongues get burned. This crust likes to stick to a pizza stone, so I have to use a little bit of elbow grease to get it to release. Surprisingly, despite the large amount of cheese that went into the fathead dough, this crust is very much like a traditional crust. It browns nicely on the bottom, firms up, and is crispy. It's very hard to tell the difference between a traditional thin and crispy dough and the fathead dough. And there you have relatively easy, homemade, low-carb pizza that is incredibly yummy. Next up, I'm going to show you spaghetti squash in place of pasta. Most people I know have heard of spaghetti squash, but few have tried it. I'm here to tell you it's not exactly like pasta, but it's close enough to help with the cravings. Cooking a spaghetti squash can be done in a few different ways. You can leave the squash whole, poke some holes in it with a fork, and boil it until it's tender. But most commonly, people bake them. 
and to do this you have to cut the squash in half lengthwise which isn't easy unless you have great knives and brute strength. Recently I learned this little tip which makes a world of difference. Poke some holes in the squash with the fork randomly around it and then microwave it for three to four minutes. This softens the skin and the meat inside so that you can cut it in half with more ease. Once it's halved, scoop out the seeds inside. If you're like me and you love pumpkin seeds, save these little gems for later because they are very similar in taste and texture. Once the halves are cleaned, give them a little olive oil, salt, and pepper and set them inside down on a baking sheet. Make sure you have a bunch of fork piercings and roast it in the oven at 400 degrees for about half an hour, depending on the size of the spaghetti squash. It should come out fork tender. Now you'll have to let it cool down a bit before you can handle it. Once the two halves are cool to the touch, take a fork and shred the insides, pulling the meat away from the skin. It should very easily turn from stringy squash into something that resembles a pile of noodles. You can leave it in the shell or serve it on a plate separately. Spaghetti squashes are like their cousin's zucchinis and they have a lot of moisture in them. If you plate the squash, it's going to leave a puddle of water on the plate. If you leave the noodles in the shell to serve as is, it will be very wet as well. What I like to do is to pull the meat and let it sit on a plate with a few paper towels under it for a minute, then replate it or return it to the shell. By this time, it's fairly cold and I'll have to microwave it for 30 or 60 seconds just so that when I douse my hot marinara on it, it won't cool everything down too quickly. Depending on the size of the squash, I estimate about one quarter of the squash is a cup, so it should yield four servings, two out of each half. Keeping that in mind, I'll make sure not to exceed a full cup of sauce for each spaghetti squash half. Then I add parmesan and mozzarella, and sometimes it's good to bake them a second time with the sauce and the cheese on top to incorporate the flavors and melt everything. But for me, this depends on my level of hunger and patience. Spaghetti squash as pasta has a little more crunch to it than flour noodles do, but their neutral flavor is perfect for flavorful sauces. Some people like to add a pat of butter and seasoning to their squash sans marinara, but it really isn't like a pasta at all then. It's more of a regular vegetable dish. It's my understanding that butternut squash can also be used as a pasta substitute and you can spiralize it like zucchini or shred it like the spaghetti. Squashes are a very underutilized vegetable that's locally grown and abundant in the fall and winter. Generally, butternut squash will have a slightly higher carb count at about 6.5 grams per cup and zucchini will have less, around 3 grams per cup. But they're both high in vitamin C, vitamin B6, potassium, and vitamin A, whereas spaghetti squash doesn't have much at all except for fiber. Next up, we're going to bake some breaded chicken. One of the things you may want to substitute is breading. There are many options for this, but I'm going to show you two right now at the same time. You'll find that with low-carb diets, dark meat chicken is not only acceptable but encouraged and will be much more economical if you're planning on having a lot of it. Personally, I prefer dark meat, so that's what I have to use today. Just because you can't use breadcrumbs doesn't mean you have to give up taste and texture. My favorite way of making low-carb encrusted chicken is to use walnuts, although pecans and similar nuts are also usable. Plus, I love walnuts and pecans, so for this reason, I buy walnuts in bulk from Costco in three pound bags. According to the label, one quarter cup of walnuts has four grams of total carbs and two grams of fiber, which means the net carbs are only two grams. Even if I double that or quadruple that, I'm still not adding that many carbs. On the other side, we have pork rinds. If you're not a fan of pork rinds for snacking, I'd recommend still giving them a chance as breading. They take well to adding spices, so you can use taco spice, Cajun, garlic and onion powder, whatever you'd like. 
Remember to check the labels though on your condiments and spices. Barbecue sauce is notoriously high in sugar, but a spice rub might be perfectly usable. Pork rinds also come flavored, but read the labels to see how this alters the net carbs. These plain pork rinds have zero carbs. That means you can use them pretty freely. So think about a crunchy topping on your green bean casserole, your mac and cheese cauliflower, and for texture and salads. So to use each of these as replacement breading, I put an estimated amount in a freezer bag and then crush them up. Rolling pins are great for this, but meat tenderizers work as well. But you can get creative and crush them on a flat surface with the pan. Whether you beat them or roll them or squish them with your fierce hands, just break them down to your desired texture. I don't mind bigger chunks, but you can run them through a grinder or a food processor if you want them finer. With walnuts, I don't usually add a ton of spices. I like them as they are. With pork rinds, I want some pep and I like to add Parmesan cheese. You'll find cheese is a very versatile food now. So if you don't have lactose intolerance or if you ignore the fact like me, cheese will be a big part of your life. This grated Parmesan has zero carbs as well as the pork rinds, so I'll go up to a 50-50 ratio of pork rinds to cheese. You just have to keep your chicken pieces on the smaller side because the cheese can burn if they're in there for 40 minutes while you cook a bone-in chicken breast. To prep these chicken thighs, I rinse them and dry them with a paper towel. From there, I'll either dip them in an egg bath, smear a layer of plain Greek yogurt on them, or cover them in a thin layer of butter. But do this for either breading, but don't go too heavily or it will make your breading soggy. Butter and walnuts are a wonderful combination, I should add. Then I will salt and pepper them to taste. Sometimes I add garlic powder. And from there, you're going to work in batches and put the pieces of chicken, whole or chopped, into the baggie, adjusting how many by the size of the baggie you're using. I like to press the breading into the chicken and really coat it well, but you do you. Once they're coated, set them aside and continue working on the rest of the chicken if there is any. Once coated, follow your preferred cooking method that's appropriate to the type and size of the chicken you're cooking. Normally, my favorite is to air fry them, but I'd like them all done at the same time today, so I'm baking them. I baked mine in the oven at 350 degrees for 20 or so minutes. If you want them crispy on both sides, flip halfway through or about 10 minutes into the baking. These came out moist and tender, lots of flavor and truly delicious. From my personal experience, let me warn you about one thing. If you're on a low carb diet and find yourself eating a lot more chicken than usual, handling it a lot more, save yourself enormous medical costs and make sure you clean your hands like you're going into surgery after handling the chicken. Scrub under your nails, really wash them well because the bacteria on raw chicken will stick around and make its way into your system through your fingers if you don't. A lot of kidney infections that happen to low-carb dieters, myself included, come from handling raw chicken. The more you handle it, the more you potentially have on your hands. Do whatever you have to do to stop biting your nails if that's one of your habits. Anything that raw chicken touches needs to be treated like it's infected, so you don't infect yourself or others. There are so many recommendations we can share, and I'd first like to mention a few blogs and Facebook pages to follow, like Low Carb Yum, Low Carb Zen, Low Carb Keto Diet, Ketogenic Recipes, and although it isn't specifically a low carb site, Skinny Taste will often give low carb options for recipes she shares, which are some of the best recipes I've encountered so far. There are low carb breads on the market, but they're usually very crumbly and fall apart if you attempt to butter it, and peanut butter is impossible. Healthy Life is a local bakery and their products are available at Walmart, Woodman's, and occasionally you can see some of their products in stock elsewhere. They have bread, English muffins, and buns that are the closest to regular breads. 
Also, bread isn't necessary anymore. We've all seen the bunless options from restaurants where they substitute lettuce for the breads, but wraps have become very common and low-carb tortillas and pitas are quite good, often veggie-based or using nut flours. Riced cauliflower is a fair substitute, and they even sell cauliflower already riced now that you can get so you don't have to break it down yourself. I find that it still tastes and feels like cauliflower unless you turn it into something with strong flavors like Mexican rice or Cajun. Desserts are still quite possible. If you use a nut flour and an alternate sweetener, you can have many things you didn't think possible. Cheesecake, pastries, cookies, and chocolates, all possible. Nutrasweet, Splenda, Stevia, Swerve are probably the most popular sweeteners because their flavors are strong and close to sugar. Xylitol is an up and coming option, but it's highly toxic to dogs and some other pets. So please be very careful with animals in the home. Different sweeteners are better and worse for various things, so read up about them and know that some will give you diarrhea, so you should be eating those in small doses. Not all vegetables are low carb, so look things up whenever you need to. As a whole, leafy greens are the lowest, followed closely by other green vegetables like asparagus and green beans and cauliflower. Slightly higher would be broccoli and peppers and then squashes. You'll want to avoid corn, potatoes, peas, and sweet potatoes. When in doubt, look it up. The same applies even more so with fruit. Some surprising fruits like grapes and cherries have the highest carb count. You'll want to stick with berries, lemons, and limes. Melons are a bit higher as are apples, nectarines, and peaches. The largest amount of carbs are in tropical fruits like bananas, pineapples, and mangoes, as well as oranges and pears. A very general rule is the warm weather growers are the ones you should avoid, although there are exceptions to that rule. Berries are always the safest way to go. Cheese is a big part of low carbing. You can make chips out of Parmesan by simply dropping a pile onto a pan and baking it. And it's innately salty so you don't have to add any. They're also good in salads and pair nicely with salsa and other dips. If you make a larger pile of cheddar or Parmesan, when you take it out of the oven and it's still a little flexible, it can be bent and turned into a taco shell or a wrap. Plus, many sweeter things are made from soft cheeses like cream cheese. There are even instructions out there on how to turn cheddar into popcorn. Finally, I'll touch on fats, which we could do an entire program on alone. We're all hearing that not all fat is bad fat, and we know that avocados and nuts are full of good fats. But for low-carb diets, you're going to have to get used to seeing butter, lard, and bacon grease frequently used in many recipes. Eggs are also a staple with their myriad of possibilities and dairy is something you'll learn to lean heavily on like cheeses and plain Greek yogurt, sour cream, heavy cream, and unsweetened nut milks. Fats are essential for good health and when humans were evolving, a huge leap occurred when they learned to hunt and eat fatty meats because fat feeds the brain. While it may not specifically make you smarter to consume more eggs, healthy fats do a number of necessary things in the body, including having some control over absorbing, breaking down, and releasing chemicals like vitamins, making energy, and cell production. Common sweet snacks on a low-carb diet are referred to as fat bombs, which are made of things like unsweetened cocoa, cream cheese, coconut oil, and other flavorings. You will definitely need to have a handful of fat bomb recipes you like in your repertoire. However, the big bad wolf of the fat world is trans fats, and you should always avoid these. And that wraps up our program introducing you to a low-carb lifestyle. We thank you for joining us, and we wish you well on your journey through low-carbing. We'll see you next month for Feed Your Mind and Body Soups.